the sun sets once again across Lake Ontario, I remind you all to put up your blackout curtains and encourage you all to gather your families, turn up the radio, and enjoy yet another evening of programming from yours truly. I am Nicholas Faircrest, here to welcome you into an evening of politics, current affairs, and music, here on Royalist Radio. Mr. Richie Everett, who came down to the studio with his band and played that live for us just last week. First, on our show tonight, we have some news from the recently reformed American Union state. It has been little over three weeks since William Dudley Pelly and his silver shirt militia seized control following President Long's arrest on Saturday. But today, Congress, under pressure from the Silver Shirts, have enacted martial law once again, and are pushing for Pelly to be inaugurated as the second president of this Christian Commonwealth of America, before Long has even gone to trial. It has only been two months after the official end to hostilities and the end of the Civil War. Charles Lindbergh has denounced this action from the Silver Shirts, claiming it is a step towards a dictatorship. Lindbergh saying, It goes against the American values we fought for. Father Charles Coughlin, a native of Ontario, who has since moved to America, has shown his support for Pelly's actions, advocating on his radio show that Pelly should have been president in the first place. He's a good man with good upstanding Christian values. He would not falter to greed and sway to Wall Street like Mr. Long. More on America after this.
International Affairs Editor at the Toronto Sun describes this political catastrophe as the result of President Long's refusal to pass a ban on the sale of alcoholic beverages. The editor wrote in today's column how this may have precipitated a large-scale rejection of Huey Long by even our most conservative neighbours to the south. Pro-Long supporters are not backing down, however. Earlier today, reports of crowds, some of whom were armed, have marched on the city centres across the nation, calling for Long's release. National Guard and Silver Shirt units have reportedly dismissed the protesters. One can only wonder how many protesters may have been shot. After all, the Union State Press are not allowed to report on such matters. The King held a speech yesterday on the matter of the silver shirts, stating the Entente stands for democracy, not a clean-cut left or right, just individual freedoms. Thus, the attempted takeover of the United States by the Silver Legion is no less a revolution than the one in the Union of Britain, nor the syndicalist threat it itself struggled to defeat in the Second Civil War. The Second American Civil War is still fresh in all of our minds. And now, is it possible that a third is on the horizon? This humble radio host remembers those long nights not two years ago where we could hear the roars of artillery and the rumbles of planes during the siege of Detroit, just across our border. Yet, brighter aspects of the war did exist. There were the additions to the Empire, the states that seceded the Union and sought the protection of our King to uphold their individual freedoms, our new allies in Alaska and New England. We all remember the photographs of cheering crowds of people escaping the bloodshed, but the question is asked, what now? The Civil War is over, and America has a government again. Many in New England are happy to be a part of the Empire, continuing the dream that was America. After all, since its independence, New England's economy has boomed following the Canadian government's investment in new startup businesses, emboldening the entrepreneurial values of its citizens. According to the Boston Globe's chief editor, New England has every right to remain independent. There was no legal basis for a state to secede from the Union in the first place. Furthermore, the new Union has yet to publish its full Articles of Confederation. Samuel Warner wrote to us to share his view. Mr. Warner owns a small accountancy firm in Burlington, Vermont. He states in his letter to us, Getting our independence and joining the Entente's protection is the best thing that's happened to us. Before now, I always saw myself as a citizen of Vermont. But now, I see myself as a New Englander. President Baxter has done wonders for our nation, and could still do more. Since coming into power, President Percival P. Baxter has worked tirelessly to improve civil rights within New England. He is a stalwart opponent of the dangerous white nationalist faction, who thankfully are banned here in Canada. He has ordered several police crackdowns on suspected nationalist leaders and officials following attacks on African-American refugees crossing the border to escape the Civil War. White nationalist sentiment has been a growing problem within the state of New York since the Civil War, and the nationalists have reportedly been gathering arms. A white nationalist spokesman, who contacted us here at the radio station, claims it is within their constitutional rights as Americans and New Englanders to bear arms. Louis Joseph Valentine, Commissioner of the New York City Police Department, has announced new city legislation in response to Baxter's crackdowns, offering to buy firearms from citizens of New York to both replenish police stocks and keep them out of the hands of the white nationalists. So far, the gun drive, as it has been colloquially called, has apparently been a success, with over 2,000 weapons being sold to the department. Yet, 
despite all unknowns and the changes put in motion by President Baxter, three days ago, a small minority of those wishing to rejoin the Union requested the New England government hold a national referendum. More surprisingly is the fact that the New England government have agreed. Baxter responded to the referendum saying, To deny anyone the chance to vote, well, that would make me a tyrant. The people of New England stood up against tyranny of all forms not too long ago in the failed United States. Yet, we've come so far on our own, and we can continue to strive forward. I have faith in the people of New England to make the right choice, the choice where we won't let tyrants get in our way. The vote in New England is set for next Wednesday, so so if you're over the age of 21 and a citizen of the New English states, please make sure you're registered to vote. The fate of New England may fall to you. If you are not registered to vote, you will not be allowed to take part in this SNAP referendum. The Canadian government has issued the following statement. We stand by the people's vote of New England and encourage the people of New England to exercise their democratic right. Alaskan officials are yet to comment on their stance on returning to the Union. I'm sure this won't be the last time we cover this story. Despite the horrors the American people went through on all sides, people still found time to make music, and here is one such example. There's a yellow rose in Texas that I am going to see No other fellow knows her, no other only me She cried so when I left her, it like to broke my heart And if I ever find her, we never more will part Hey! Hey! Next round's on me, boys <laughs> She's the sweetest rose of color this soldier ever knew. Her eyes are bright as diamonds, they sparkle like the dew. You may talk about your dearest may and sing of Rosalie, but the yellow rose of Texas is the only girl for me. Hey. Yeah, yeah. Where the Rio flowing and the starry skies are bright she walks along the river in the quiet summer night she thinks if i remember when we parted long ago i promise to come back again and never leave her so for some lighter news. The circus has come to town. A travelling circus group is setting up this week here in Toronto. Cirque Zvieta is a circus from the Russian Republic and will be in town for the coming week. The name means Circus of Light and boasts a spectacular show of music, dance, tricks and effects. The circus is particularly different to the local style, combining traditional circus skills with the operatic arts. The circus's leading attraction is its ballet troupe, who trained at the Bolshoi Ballet. Back in my early years, I had the utmost pleasure of seeing a performance of the Nutcracker at the Bolshoi Theatre, whilst on a tour of Moscow, back when I was but a mere writer for the Daily Mail. It was one of the only joys within a frankly mundane working holiday, interviewing the then-President Kerensky after the Kolchak Putsch. 
Two months later, I landed my first job at the BBC as a broadcaster. One year after that, I was booking passage to Canada on the first boat I could find. Sadly, those of you who are listening will not be able to share the joys of going to the Bolshoi Theatre, as it was one of the many cultural landmarks of Moscow that was destroyed by the Bolsheviks in their second uprising, which ultimately ended in failure. Coincidentally, one of the performers within this troupe is none other than the niece of the late Alexander Kerensky, Isabel Baranovskaya. We sent one of our technicians down to the Imperial Theatre, who are hosting the circus, to record some of the ballet movements. Here, exclusively, are excerpts from the Allegro and the Adagio movements of the performance. Circus opens every day this week from 3pm, 
with the main performance starting at 5 p.m. Entry is 50 pence per person or 20 pence per child. The circus will close at 8 p.m. to abide by the royal curfew that has been in place since the reconquest was declared. On the topic, after the allotted break, we will have some exciting news from the War of Reconquest itself. On this day five years ago, we saw one of our darkest since 1925. The unveiling of the Totalist Charter and the dawning of the crimson shadow that has since plagued Europe. But, fear not, friends. Our solidarity and our loyalty to our king will allow this glorious empire to remain as the bulwark against the totalist threat. But things are looking up, and only up. Thanks to the Bill C-7 passing two years ago, we've managed to jumpstart our military's path to victory. The HMCS Reconquest, the first super-heavy battleship in the Royal Navy of its class, left the docks at Halifax last week and joins the fight in the Atlantic. Information on its exact specifications have been withheld by the government throughout its construction to protect it from totalist spies. What we do know is it boasts over 30 guns primed and ready to bring the totalists to their knees. As always, you too can do your bit to go the extra mile for the Empire. Men of the Empire, do you have the will to do what is necessary? Will you defend our homes, our livelihoods? Enlistment offices are open till 8pm every day in all major metropolitan areas. Sign up. Do your part. Homeowners, invest into Empire Loans today. Support the rearmament of our fair empire. And now for the first of our intervals this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy this uninterrupted musical interlude. <laughs>
Thank you.
Welcome back to the second part of our show. As always, I am Nicholas Faircrest. Later on the show, we'll hear the story of one of our brave pilots in some news from the War of Reconquest. But first, a report from the war in mainland Europe. Metal European forces have been pushed back to new defensive positions along the Rhineland. Although the German forces held back the communal army at the Ludendorff line for a number of months, the, the armies of Flanders, Wallonia and the Netherlands were overwhelmed this week by superior international forces spearheading weak points in their defence, causing a mass rout. Field Marshal August von Mackensen, who was in charge of the defence of the Ludendorff line, has begun a series of delaying actions to hold back the totalist tide, whilst the Northern Front reorganises from its route along the cologne mittelberg parallel. The government of Flanders Wallonia was evacuated and is now overseeing operations from their honorary consulate in Stuttgart. It is currently rumoured that in the ensuing panic of the rout, that the royal family of Flanders Wallonia also evacuated the capital of Brussels in search of sanctuary in Berlin. But there has been no report of them arriving safely. The king of Flanders Wallonia is Adelbert von Hollenzorin, the third son of German Kaiser Wilhelm II. There are whispers that the royal family's Sable FH-104 was shot down by a pilot of one of the armies of the Internationale. The Commune of France are claiming one of their pilots from the Army D The Commune of France are claiming one of their pilots from the People's Air Force, Guy Bottier, shot it down whilst flying a recon flight over Liège. But they aren't the only ones claiming the kill. The Union of Britain have claimed that a member of their female flying corps, Marion Wilberforce, shot down the royal plane from the seat of her Spitfire, somewhere over Antwerp. To make matters worse, the German government has not denounced either of its enemies' claims, leaving the rest of us fearing the worst for the royal family of Flanders Wallonia. Minister of Defence and Chief of the Federal Forces, Leon de Grel, has denied the claims that the royal family of Flanders Wallonia have fallen stating in a press conference from Stuttgart that the king and his family are remaining in hiding for their own protection. The people of Flanders and Wallonia should not fear. Only continue to fight the totalist threat. Do not listen to the totalist lies. We cannot know the true fate of the royals unless we hear from them themselves, or we get word from Germany. The effect of the missing royals are nonetheless being felt already. And to our benefit. Admiral William Klaus, formerly of the second Flanders Wallonia fleet, has switched sides in support of the true king and valiant Entente General Albert, who has been training a free Belgian corps here in Canada. Like our own king, the former king of Belgium resides here in Canada, in exile awaiting the fateful day where he can reclaim his birthright in Europe and defeat the totalist threat. Belgium's situation is rather more complex than our own, however. post weltkrieg Belgium became the German puppet of Flanders Wallonia. Our king has promised Belgium's hero monarch that if he aids the Entente in the war against the totalist threat, that he will petition the German bloc for Albert's return to the throne. Many Belgian monarchists reacted badly to what they deemed reluctance and hypocrisy from the Commonwealth leadership. One outspoken member of the Belgian in exile community is General Victor van Strydendok de Berkel, who is renowned for leading the last cavalry charge by the Entente in the Weltkrieg. In an interview with the Toronto Star last month, Buckle describes the king's unwillingness to fight the Germans as proof of the king is hiding behind a totalist scapegoat for his own failures and his father's failures in the face of the Kaiser back in 1921. Buckle later retracted his absurd statement to the Star after pressure from both the Canadian government and King Albert of Belgium. 
In response, Prince Leopold, Albert's son, released a statement to the Star claiming, The free people of Belgium will stand with our Entente allies in wholehearted solidarity. The Belgian nation in exile has managed to raise one corps of troops to fight for the Entente thus far, numbering 55,000 men. Some of the free Belgian forces are veterans from the Great War, but many are volunteers from the large Belgian communities within Quebec, many of whom come from families who moved here following the peace of 1921. If you are a Belgian national residing within Canada and are of able body, Prince Leopold is calling for you to do your bit in reclaiming your birthright. The free Belgian forces are in the process of raising a new corps and need brave young men to do their bit. The Canadian government, in conjunction, have also formed three Belgian squadrons of the RAF. Speaking of the RAF, there is no more glorious and gentlemanly way to help the war effort than by joining an aircrew. The Royal Air Force are the only branch of our brave armed forces that actively partake in air, land and sea combat. They are our first point of contact with the enemy and fight daily sorties with the totalist fiends, engaging their air force and navy over the Atlantic. Soon they will dominate the skies of the homeland itself. Will you be there? In just a moment, we will hear the story of one of our brave RAF pilots in this fresh report from the recent Battle of the Azores. But first, some music. landing the final coup de grace on the commune vessel, the Gascogne. But first, let us set the scene. As you're all probably well aware, the Azores have been home to the government in exile of our Portuguese allies since the Spanish invasion of Portugal last year. As a staunch ally of the Entente, Portugal was a strategically important nation, in our alliance chain. 
Canada and Free France alike had units stationed there to support the Africa Front opened up by the Internationale's invasion of Tunis. Originally, the Kingdom of Portugal were not formally part of the Entente, remaining neutral in an attempt to keep Spain neutral. The King of Portugal, fearing international aggression and a Spanish invasion, did in fact loan many ports and military bases during this neutral phase. On the 12th of July, 1940, King Durante's fears were correct. CNT FAI forces crossed the Portuguese-Spanish border in Baja and pushed rapidly to the capital of Lisbon. The Portuguese army was soon overwhelmed, retreating to the north to fight a guerrilla campaign, whilst the government, navy and air force fled to the safety of the Azores. Since then, the combined navies of the international forces from Spain, the Commune of France and the Union of Britain have been sieging the Azores relentlessly including two failed landing attempts by the Union of Britain. The Commonwealth's second fleet was sent to break the siege. Now, to the battle. At 0600 on the 2nd of May, Task Force 3 of the Royal Navy, led by Admiral Dudley Pound, spots a large French force coming to reinforce the sieging Spanish Navy. Pound radios to Admiral Mountbatten, who is trailing with the carrier task force by about 300 nautical miles. Mountbatten scrambles his fighters in an attempt to gain early air superiority. One of those fighters was flown by our hero, Burling. At around 0745, the 22 planes launched from the decks of the Hermes and the Empress, grouped with Pound's task force. Pound's task force then engaged the French fleet. A bombardment of our brave ships began, squaring off to a superior in number but outdated commune force. At 0800 hours, Burling spots planes at his 5 o'clock. Spanish fighters dispatched from Spain's only aircraft carrier, the Libertad. They began engaging our brave fighters. Burling turned his former to face the oncoming planes, using the sun to mask his approach. A spiraling aerial display of bullets and maneuvers ensued. Burling managed to shoot down six Spanish fighters before his left wing took substantial damage and he was forced to return. On the way back, he took on another three fighters, defying all odds. Burling managed to pilot his fighter all the way back to the safety of the Hermes. Upon exiting his craft, a flight controller by the name of Sergeant Richards noticed Burling was bleeding from the bicep. Burling, despite much protest, was ordered to the sick bay. Apparently, a hail of Spanish bullets had breached the cockpit and a round had penetrated the muscle in Burling's arm. Medic stressed the wound, and after much argument from Burling, he returned to the flight deck to try and get back into the air. Upon returning to the flight deck, Burling was informed his former was unable to fly. Frustrated, he demanded his CO let him back into the air some other way. There were no other former fighters available. But due to sickness, the Hermes was down a few of its Albacore bomber pilots. Luckily, Burling originally trained as a bomber pilot before becoming the fighter ace he is today. Burling was attached to the 778th Naval Air Squadron and took to the skies once more. The counterattack had begun. The Spanish had all but fled from the battle, but the French Navy remained. A fierce bombardment leapt from the two French dreadnoughts and their 14-inch guns, as well as potent fire from the 15-inch guns of the Gascogne, suppressing Pound's task force and landing hit after hit. The situation was looking dire. The 778th NAS leapt into action, diving into their first bombing run, first of all targeting the Justice, one of the French dreadnoughts. 
the 778th released their torpedoes. But no luck. The Justice turned to starboard just in time to avoid the glancing blow. Seeing that their Spanish allies no longer had the air superiority, the French battleships began to retreat. The wounded ships from Pound's task force let off one final volley before doing the same. A shell from the HMCS Royal Oak landed a penetrating hit on the stern below the waterline of the Gascon, crippling its rudder and its ability to turn. The 778th were already returning to base after failing to land their strikes on the dreadnought. Burling's craft, however, did not manage to launch its torpedo due to a system failure. Burling thought to himself, if God is with us, he will help us win this war. And he will help me get this final shot. Burling broke formation in an attempt to try again. In a foolhardy act of courage, defying all orders, Burling began a steep dive to attack the wounded Gascon. As if an act of God had intersected with an act of fate in the weave of the universe, the torpedo released and propelled towards the limping French vessel. A direct hit. She was dead in the water. The madman, the kestrel of the Azores had succeeded where others had failed and made sure the French and the Spanish alike paid for attacking our ally in the Atlantic. Burling returned to the Hermes a hero, and will soon be returning to Canada a hero on a drive to sell war bonds. Appearance dates for Burling's bond drive will appear in next week's show. Well, that's about all we have time for on our show tonight. Before I leave you with some music, I would like to take a moment to remind us all that no other nation has the tenacity we, the people of the Commonwealth, have to fight for what is ours. Our freedoms, our homes, our families, our birthright. We will end the cycle of tyranny gripping Europe. The false freedoms of the totalists, the underhanded warmongering of the Kaiser. We will fight, and we will win. Good night all, and God save the King. Everybody and thank you for watching forward slash listening to this first episode of Radio Kaiserreich, what was known as Project Birthright. My name is Alex, some of you might recognize me as the content creator Midgeman. I am the creative lead behind Radio Kaiserreich. Radio Kaiserreich is a project that's been in the works for a while now, and I'd like to first up thank the guys over at Kaiserreich for allowing me and entrusting me with their lore and doing something a little bit different and a little bit well, unheard of with Kaiserreich stuff before. Everything else has been world building, whereas this is taking that world and creating something alternate history with it. We also hope that you enjoy this sort of different format from the normal videos. And if you do, please let us know in the comments below because your feedback is what really matters. 
Speaking of you folks at home, this could not happen without our Patreons. First up, we'd like to take a moment to thank our top backer, Connor Reed, for all of his support through both the web shop and through Patreon. Connor, everything you're doing is helping create fun work like this, so I hope you enjoy your merchandise. We'd also like to thank our other Patreons. Daniel Smith, Alexander, Russell Apfel, Tiber109, Ben Davenport, Noah Humphrey, and DePrusen. This month, we would also like to thank our Discord Nitro supporters, Jonathan Bagley and Reese Harlett, for giving our server that boost and allowing us all those fun Discord Nitro perks. I'd also like to thank our new patrons of this month Chloe Erin, Berg Kimberly, Andrew Duran, Balspawn, Brandy Buck, Higgins the Seagull, Kerensky, Lawrence Walsh, Luke Downer, Martin Lee, Matthew Schwartz, Michael Furry, Mojot Gen Gen 55 NS, Pablo Fernandez, Quinn Curtis, Rob Spierre was right, Sarah Parker Schmidt, Shane Montoya, Sir Shake, Vincent Galliana, Alice Oakland, Rufflecopter, and Rune Ildor Peterson. I do apologize if I got anyone's names wrong there. I am terrible. Also, of course, a massive thank you to all our other Patreon supporters. As I've said probably many times already, we could not create work like this without you. Your money goes directly to artists and creatives creating work within the Kaiserreich world and the running and development of the Kaiser Cat Cinema. If you are interested in supporting us, there's two ways you can do it. First up, going into the description and going on our merch store where you can buy fantastic hoodies such as this one. This one is so soft, I've washed it and it's still retained its softness. The quality is really lovely. I am in no way sponsored to say... <laughs> no. Uh, or you can get things like mugs. I've got mugs the size of my head and I drink a lot of tea, so having a mug that big is fantastic. Profits from the merch store go directly back to creatives and it funded into creating new works such as Radio Kaiser X. So if you've liked this, why not check that out? Another backbone of our support is Patreon. And if you want to give a little bit, even a little bit, to support the creative backbone of, of Kaiser Cat Cinema, go down into the description below and become a Patreon today. Your money goes into creating exciting new work. And that's honestly one of the best things you can do. All right, that's about all I've got time for today. So. Again, thank you all so much for watching, and leave a like down below if you've liked it, dislike if you didn't, and why not comment telling me what your favourite part of episode one of Radio Kaiser Act was, and tell me what you think episode two might just be. Alright, I'll see you in the next one, cats.